Welcome, welcome, welcome. I did want to just kind of remind you um, of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance and some of the work that we're doing. And I'll, I'll cover some of that later. And the only reason why this is really important is I just want to establish uh, some uh, premise uh, for the work that we're doing, Some give you some foundation. Uh, because uh, with Justice for All, that's the, um, the uh, C4 organization that actually led to uh, the work of the Racial Justice Alliance. Uh, in, in conjunction with that work, what we have been able to do over the last several years is create a pretty extensive uh, body of work uh, in addressing uh, systemic racism in the state. Of course, we didn't call it systemic racism when we started the work because, because I didn't really know what that was. Uh, and I was, you know, what we were doing was, is we were, we were addressing racial disparities in the criminal justice system initially, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Why is this important? The reason why it's important is, is what I'm doing is, is I'm premising the work because it's so important to make those connections as far as how we found ourselves where we are. Um, fast forward to the Racial Justice Alliance, and yes, I will fill in the blank with some of that work in a, in a little while. Um, but fast forward to the Racial Justice Alliance. What we're here to do is, is to create that sustainable power and ensure that there's agency and provide security for American descendants of slavery uh, while embracing their, their history and preserving their culture. That's the um, mission statement of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. And that's, the, that's how we're positioned to do the work of the platforms and, in, and initiatives, which PR2 is a part of a one element of this um, platform of this last uh, biennium. Um, the, the platform was ACT, Acknowledge, Create, and Transform. So as a part of that platform, it was a, a pretty good sized list of initiatives, uh, legislative agenda. Um, and um, so this is, PR2 is a part of it. One moment, please. And like I told you, we're at the Richard Kim Center, like I told you, and we've got, um, we're, we're uh, inviting guests in and so forth. So we have, uh, Youssef just came in and we were, for, for some odd reason, I thought we were all um, Zoom tonight, but anybody who comes in the door, we're gonna let them in the door. Um, I just wanted to, you know, just make you aware, in addition to platforms and, init init and initiatives, oh, let me just pause there. The uh, legislative agenda for the, previous biennium was called Change Vermont. <clears throat> and it was, you know, pretty, I think, um, in some ways it was kind of challenging because there is there is this sentiment that, you know, here in Vermont, we just never want to change. But I think the more we dig into this work and the more that we vision, you know, who we are as a state and who we are as a people and where we're going politically, economically, spiritually, the whole nine yards, uh, we do understand um, that, of course, we need to always be changing. Um, the funny thing about that is, is we had that that um, that old red barn, and it, and, it, and on the side of it, it said, "Sadly, take back Vermont." And what we did is, is we crossed out to take back, and we put change over it um, in a same font. So it drew attention, to say the least. And that that was when we started the um, the, the um, constitutional amendment, which was in 2019. And you'll see in a little bit that this thing's been going on uh, for nearly four years. Outreach and education is part of what we're doing right now. We link all of our policies, our platforms and initiatives, most all of them uh, to some form of outreach and education initiative, uh, community engagement and support, just a whole bunch of stuff that we're doing in community from uh, small business grants and uh, personal assistance uh, across uh, a rapid response and um, affinity spaces. And uh, there's uh, the, you know, our flagship first African landing day, uh, just all types of stuff with, um, with uh, community engagement and support, which actually intersects with our cultural empowerment piece, which is the cornerstone of everything that we do. I want to talk a little bit before we get into too deeply into this is, is I want to talk about uh, systemic racism, because what we keep saying it and nobody seems to be able to define it so well, we defined it. So what we did is, is we, in some of the work that we've been doing is, is we've, all of us uh, within the Alliance, all, everybody, most everyone on staff, cause we just brought someone on recently. So I don't, I wanna be accurate in what I'm saying, but most all of us carry a book around with us and it's called Racist America, 
uh, roots, uh, current realities, future reparations. It's by this little white guy out of uh, Texas. His name is Joe Fagan, and Kimberly Ducey uh, helped him with this book. Uh, he's got about maybe um, 58 other books that he's written. Uh, and we pulled a definition, and this, this is one. There are many uh, definitions of systemic racism. And the reason why I wanted to share this with you is because I really never, it's kind of like American Express. I usually don't leave home without it uh, because uh, all of our work is largely premised uh, in the fact that, you know, there are uh, unjustly gained political and economic power uh, that's possessed by white people. Uh, and there's also a continuing economic and other resource inequalities along racial lines. And we've figured that out, not just through our historical research, but also um, through, our, um, through our quantitative and qualitative uh, analysis that's ongoing, that's documented on our website. Uh, and that is also available in various forms across many, many other uh, venues. And so we see more and more today that there are uh, racial disparities uh, that are adverse uh, impact in Black folks uh, across all of our social determinants, housing, education, employment, health services, access, economic development, tr uh, transportation, the so-called criminal justice system, and the list goes on and on. And it's well documented and it's consistent and it's persistent and it's simultaneous and it's insidious. Uh, so these are this is what we connect to the institution of slavery. So a lot of times, and this, this, the reason why this conversation is really important is because we, there is a lexicon uh, we've established where we refer to systemic racism as a legacy of the institution of slavery. And I know a lot of folks have a hard time making that connection, um, but we believe it's well established. And we also believe that maybe there are some folks who will never um, come to an understanding that there is a connection uh, between slavery uh, and what we call the this um, systemic racism or the legacy of slavery. But this is where we're premised. This is the work that we're, um, this is how we premise the work that we're uh, doing. And, and it's actually how we discovered the constitution uh, in its current state, uh, because our work, which is, which is lengthy, led us to the constitution and we became concerned about some of the language in the constitution. Um, I also want to men mention the emotion-laden racist framing, racist framing uh, created by whites to maintain and rationalize uh, privilege and power. Um, systemic racism, I think, is in in important to understand that it, encom it encompasses the dominant white racial frame. In other words, how to, we're not talking about, we're talking about dominant. We're not talking about all white people. We're talking about a, the framing that the vast majority of folks uh, fr how folks frame things uh, with racist attitudes, ideologies, emotions, narratives, as well as uh, discriminatory actions. Now we start to get into overt racism because that takes uh, an individual discriminatory actions. And what you see from this definition is, is that overt racism is actually born out of systemic racism. So very difficult to have a conversation these days, many days, about systemic racism without uh, a person trying to leap to the end of the conversation and declare that they are not a racist. Well, the conversation surrounding systemic racism has nothing to do with whether anybody is a racist. It has more to do with the remnants, uh, the legacy of slavery uh, and the ongoing impact that it has uh, on uh, black and brown folks in America today. So I just wanted to frame that up. If it exists anywhere, it exists everywhere by its na nature. It's insidious. It is auto-correcting, uh, self-correcting. Uh, it is self-healing. Uh, it morphs uh, when it's identified. Uh, so this is something that, that we as a nation have dealt with throughout the entire history of this nation, this, um, this, um, this, this thing that we call systemic racism. So I wanted to make sure that you didn't get away uh, without me sharing that with you today. Um, I don't feel special because everybody uh, who usually gets on with us um, has the opportunity to hear uh, some of those, um, some of that parts of that definition. <clears throat> now, I want to talk before I go through this slide. I think uh, what I'm, what I might want to do is, is I, I, I think what I want to do is, is I'm going to skip over some of this presentation <clears throat> and share with you a little bit about ACT. Uh, that legislative agenda that I told you about a little while ago. Now, keep in mind that while all of this is going on, there's, com there's community engagement and support happening. 
There's outreach and education happening. There's cultural empowerment happening. But this right here, what we're talking about is, is platforms and initiatives. And this platform, this, this platform is a statewide platform. There is also a citywide platform that we've introduced here called Operation Phoenix Rise in the city of Burlington. We may uh, go over a piece of that perhaps, uh, but I just, I think this is all really, really important because it premises the work that we're talking about. It's this stuff, a lot of this stuff predates PR2. A lot of this stuff, had, we're, we were working on things that, 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 that's, that are in front of you right now that we were working on before we started to work a PR2. So when we went into this last legislative session, which was two years ago, the Acknowledge, Create, Transform um, legislative agenda, yes, PR2 is already on that agenda. Why? The reason why is because it takes two biennium to pass a constitutional amendment. So keep in mind, the legislature, the Senate, as well as the House, what happened in 2019 and 2020, in 2019 and 2020, this is the 21 and 22 legislative agenda that you're looking at now. But in 2019 and 2020, what happened is, is PR2 was introduced to the Senate along with our change Vermont legislative agenda, some of which some of these items were on it as well because they carried over. It came out of the House, the Senate Government Operations Committee was passed almost unanimously in the Senate in 2019 with the exception of one vote. It We can't hear you, Mark. We you would hear. understand that. There you go. Now we can hear you. We had we had already we'd all when this was introduced we had already passed PR two out of the full legislature one round. Okay, so that's very important to understand. Um, is there something wrong with my microphone? It was, but we can hear you now. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> so I don't want to mess up my momentum here, but for some odd reason, I, I just want to make sure that. Okay, so we're the other piece that I wanted to show you um, before we get too deeply in too deep into this. And, and I'm just going to skip over some slides because I'm not going to, you know, give you like death by power PowerPoint today is um, this component here. And so as you can see, the um, the constitutional amendment, as I told you before, um, and, and I know it's going to take a little bit of patience and it's going to take a little bit of perseverance just to kind of sit through this little piece that goes on the front end um, because everybody just wants the details. Everybody's like, well, um, what's it going to do? Or why are we amending the Constitution? Uh, I thought we were the first state to abolish slavery or all of those conversations. Okay. All I'm asking right now is, is just give me a little latitude and let me explain to you uh, how we got where we are. Okay, fair enough. So, and, and then what I'll do is I'll pause instead of talking at you um, before we get into the constitutional amendment. I'll, you know, we can have a little conversation and, and we can move a little bit further, but this, this is the 101. This is kind of, you know, this, this is the best way that I can figure out how we as an organization, because we owe it to you, we owe it to the state. Uh, we're not broadcasting today because we had some um, difficulty. We'll be back on Saturday. We have another engagement on Tuesday. We have another engagement on Wednesday. Uh, I think um, the All Souls Church on Saturday, the First Congregational Church on Tuesday, the um, First Baptist Church on Wednesday, um, the, um, the, the library here in Burlington on Thursday. Uh, we'll be broadcasting from there. So we're going to be at it. We're going to be after this, and we're going to be explaining this in, in, in a similar way every step of the way. Um, so I want, to, I, I want to just bring your attention to the dates here, because in 2017, <clears throat> there was no PR2. Why? Because you can't amend the Constitution in 2017. Did we know that, you, did, that the language existed in 2017? Yes, we knew. But it was... 
2015 was the, was the time that you could have amended the Constitution before this. Why? Because the Constitution says that you can only amend it every four years. So what you see is, is that we, dis we discovered this in 2015. We're a little bit late to the party and nobody really understood it or even hardly believed it. But it would, what would happen is, is here uh, in 2017, we would come with a legislative agenda, which would be our first legislative agenda. And this is as justice for all in 2017. What were we coming with? And I'm not gonna go over this whole list, so be patient with me. I just want you to know that in 2017, what we discovered is, and this is gonna shock and appall some of you because we just saw recently a report uh, by our, um, our state auditor, Mr. Doug Hoffer, that, that really speaks to exactly what I'm getting ready to tell you is, is can you believe that some of the police weren't doing their training? Uh, can you believe that um, the fear and impartial policing policy wasn't being properly implemented during that time? Yeah, so it's like um, deja vu all over again. So what was happening during that time is, is we wanted to create an oversight apparatus for the entire criminal justice system. That's Title 20, 2366, and Title 20, 2358. That's, that would include race data collection, um, policy, and training. So what, what we asked for was an oversight apparatus. What we got was an advisory apparatus. So that was um, Act 54. Now, what a lot of people don't realize, very, very important, because this right here is, this, what, this is what pivots everything, everything, is, is that what we discovered is, as a re there was a secondary portion to that policy. The secondary portion was the Attorney General's and the Human Rights Commission's task force on disparities in all systems of state government. Now think about that. What we discovered through that reporting and through that analysis conducted by the Attorney General and the Human Rights Commission was is that there is in fact, there, are, there were in fact, and there is in fact, racial disparities across all systems of state government. This is, and if you wanna find this, you're in front of your computer, I know you are, just go ahead and Google um, Act 54, Attorney Generals and Human Rights Commission's Task Force, uh, all systems, and you, you will be able to pull that report up and you'll be able to view it for yourself. Why is that so critical? Because it validated this assertion that this systemic racism was a thing as we were moving through this thing, as we continued to try to figure this whole thing about the institution of slavery. The next year, we'd go on to implement the, uh, the, the racial equity executive director panel. That was our legislative agenda. That's, and what we sought to do is, is to create that, and that panel would be independent from the state government of Vermont. It is not. We sought independence. What we got is, is that the governor said, nope, she's going to report to me. So that's why Susanna Davis reports to the governor today. Um, unfortunately, she really doesn't even report directly to the governor because it was his discretion to place her under the agency uh, of um, administration. It was formerly Susanna, Susanna Young, who's now our attorney general, but um, that, that bill was actually vetoed initially and we had to compromise. The list goes on and on and, and I will just flag that HR 25 is incredibly important because HR 25 introduced by Re Representative China in 2018. Now, at this time, we had already watched the state of Colorado attempt to amend their constitution to abolish slavery and fail. And then they tried again, and this would be the year in which they'd done so. Very important. And I'm gonna pause right after this. Uh, is, is that what we sought to do is because we knew that the Constitution could be amended in 2019. Now watch this. Only the Senate can, can initiate a constitutional amendment. Only the Senate in only every four years. So thank you. So what we knew is in 2018, if we were to do anything, we could send up a smoke signal. So what we did is, is in the House, we said, how about if you... How about if you provide a, um, introduce a resolution, House, introduce a resolution urging next year's Senate to amend the Constitution? 
So this is very, very little known. Um, and part of it, and, and I, I'm not picking on NBC5, um, I'm glad you're here, but part of the reason why that is, is because it's not being covered. These things are not being covered in the press. This is why we are less than seven weeks out and there's so little information out on this because this is not sexy. This is not, this is not um, really, it's, it's really not even comfortable, quite frankly. And nobody really, why would you want to talk about amending the constitution in the state where we're the first state to abolish slavery, allegedly? So there, and then there's just this angst, obviously, that folks, all folks, but now I'm talking about, you know, political and economic power, and I'm talking about white folks in general, there, there's this challenge. So that's that's one of the reasons why it's so important that our partners, the Vermont Interfaith Action, and the 70 congregations that we're working with, us to include one of them, um, it, representing 16,000 people across the state is so important because we knew, we anticipated that this was going to be a challenge getting the word out. So anyway, back to this, this HR 25, we did in fact, and this is a part of our history of Vermont and no one can ever take this away from us. There was a, a resolution, a house resolution in 2018 that was introduced that urged the 2019 Senate. Now, mind you, we were kind of in a similar situation that we're in right now. Even year, what does the even year mean in the, in the state of Vermont? It's an election year. It doesn't make any difference which year it is. If it's an even year, it's an election year. And what that means is every single legislator is up for, le is up for a re-election and every single statewide official is up for re-election. So we knew that. Um, the, the reason why I bring that point up is because they were urging a body that did not exist to take up the a constitutional amendment the following year. We did the same thing in the Senate. The pro Tim at the time was Tim Ash. He refused to even allow it to be introduced. But it was introduced in the, in the House, but it didn't go anywhere because Sarah Copeland Hodges allowed it to hang on the wall and die. That's the story. You got it from me. So, so we were at this thing already even before 2019. The reason why I'm showing you this slide here is just to let you understand that there were a bunch of other things that we were doing to include um, the, um, and I think that should be four, 478, uh, the reparations bill should be, it was actually 478 that year. Uh, well, that's, I'm sorry, this is, that's actually, um, I think it might be alluding to this year. Just suffice it to say, we've had a reparations bill on the house and in the house uh, for the last four years. So we started that this in 17. We knew it wasn't going to go anywhere in 19, but we brought it back anyway. But you see um, the health equity bill, which you just saw passed this year. Um, you see, uh, last year rather, you see the resolution, uh, public health emergency um, that just passed last year, joint resolution and others. And there's also some Burlington work and we didn't date these, but all of this stuff is converging on the conversation of systemic racism. And now this sets us up uh, to have a conversation of why the Constitution? Because really what we're talking about is, is the institution, forget about what the Constitution says, let's just say hypothetically, the Constitution said that slavery was permitted. Just humor me. Let's just say hypothetically, our Constitution in Vermont says that slavery existed uh, or, or is permitted in any way. Uh, connecting all of the dots that I just gave you, and I'll just open it up right now and stop uh, screen sharing uh, for any form of conversation if, if anybody wants to. But given the conversation that I just gave you, uh, or the background that I just gave you, um, is it becoming, maybe it's becoming increasingly clear that we were, what, we, what we're doing here is, is we're connecting dots because we believe that the institution of slavery is reprehensible. And I think everybody on this call would probably agree with that. If you do, just nod your head. If you don't, then get off. No, I'm just kidding. So, it, it, so, there, there, is, so there, is, there is a common agreement <clears throat> that, it is, that it is a crime against humanity, the institution of slavery. We, I think we all understand uh, that it is an abomination. Uh, it has created so much pain, so much distrust, so much anguish, 
And what we understand here, as we connect the dots and we look at its legacy, that it has sustained itself and it continues to create racial dis- across uh, political and economic divides across racial lines. So anything to do with the institution of slavery, we ought to have a problem with. Can we all agree on that? Absolutely. We ought to have a problem with that. And if we don't, that's fine, because if there's somebody here who's not persuadable on that particular point, then not only are you on the wrong call, but I'm not going to I'm not going to have that conversation with you. Um, I, in fact, I'm not even interested, quite frankly, in having a conversation with a bunch of persuadables, um, because I believe in my heart and, and I've overestimated this state before. And it was a huge slap in the face when I saw how CARES Act and ARPA funding was distributed, but that's a whole nother conversation because this is a political and economic divide along racial lines. We'll come back to that. But the the point I'm really getting after is simply that we do see, again, you know, we talked about the Act 54 Attorney General's and Human Rights Commission's report. We see all of the data on our website. We understand the, our history of a nation. We know what the Civil War was fought for. We know that there was no constitutional co- uh, convention that happened after it. We understand the impacts of the 13th, 14th, and the 15th Amendments and what they tried to do and failed to do. We understand all of the Civil Rights Acts and what they tried to do and failed to do, but yet we are here and we're in 2022, post January 6, 2021, where there were Confederate flags flying in our state house and we're still having a conversation about this thing that tore the nation apart about this thing where the last time we as a nation tried to abolish it it caused a secession slavery so this is an important conversation this is an important conversation and it's important for us to to talk this thing out and say well what are we doing here and so I I submit to you, I posit that if there is any language that in any way permits slavery in our constitution, we ought to do something about it. Uh, What are your thoughts? Um, Karin, I saw you, you, you're first. Go ahead, get in there, girl. I know you got something to say. Well, you know, shout out to you, brother, because you out here. um, I saw an article, trying to pull that up, that Vermont, was it which newscast was it? WCAX, and they had a professor from Vermont Law School. And shout out to Max for writing my letter of recommendation to Vermont Law School's master's program, though. But it's a whole other story because I will be talking to that law school because <laughs> if they're going to have me in there, they're going to have to definitely figure out how to make it very clear to all their professors that this that slavery not only exists, it still exists. Actually, if you watch Evolution today, the first episode says slavery is, what is it, slave Max? Slavery is still alive. Matter of fact, it was never abolished. And um, the whole accept part, he's trying to say the professor that they had that um, it's not going to change anything. It's just language. And obviously it has to be a white man can say that because, you know, it's just so real out here. Look at the way we live in Vermonters, look at the black Vermonters, how um, it's just so lost we are because we have never been able to fully be ourselves, express ourselves. And it's everybody's issue. I always say to the light-skinned girls, you would be required to um, give your p- papers if you were on a plantation. So I don't know why, you know, this is your problem too. To uh, If you watch Femme Patel, you'll see that it was the um, the white woman's issues too. So it's uh, everyone's issues because we're all trying to be citizens and we're trying to we the people, okay? So I'm with you, brother. Um, and it's real out here. It's real out here. And you're out here doing the thing. You're out here speaking truth to power. So shout out to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, the thing is, is like, oh, look, Vince made it in. Holla at your boy, Vincent. <laughs> peace, 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 everybody. <laughs> so yeah, the thing is, is that um, it's important that we acknowledge uh, you know, the reality of the world that we're living in today. And I think one of the things that we got to get after is, is how do we help each other step past this cognitive dissonance and get to a point to where we're able to come to terms with what it is that we're looking at with the intention of doing something about it. 
with the intention of doing something about it because it is within our grasp today. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what we've come, all of the hurdles that we've that we've uh, that we've traversed to get to the point to where we are today, um, and also you know just how short the path is to lead us to a point to where we've actually accomplished what it is that we sought out to do. Um, but as far as what you've seen and heard so far, um, is there a general awareness of some of this stuff? Um, Adrian, have you, have you heard of any of these uh, policies that I mentioned like uh, Act 54 or, um, or maybe um, Act 9 with the Racial Equity Executive Director? Were you aware of the fact that this work was tied into some of the work, uh, this um, constant, the work of amending the Constitution? I was not, um, mm -hmm. but that's again, like, that's why I said I'm, that's why I'm here. I want to learn more and I want to be able to articulate this correctly to people so they understand the significance of why something like this needs to happen in November. Because like you said too, like, there isn't a lot of coverage on this. And this is something that's like extremely important. I don't understand why it's not more of a more prevalent in our newscast, especially when this is something that people are going to be voting on. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I appreciate your candor and just you showing up with your whole heart. Uh, that's that's really important. And I think, um, Jaina, just tying into the work that you're doing nationally, and I know um, there's, you know, there's some prison labor. Um, I said it, I said it, prison labor. A lot of people are saying that and I don't really use use that term a lot but I, I know that that is some of this is tying into your work I'd be curious to hear what prompted you to show up how'd you end up here and 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 what is this how is this um informing your work yeah I appreciate you asking so I mostly am here like as an interested citizen because just with what's been going on around the country I feel like if slavery, even a loophole, is still on our amendment, things are getting worse in our country. So I fear like what that could mean for the future. Like if we have conservatives here, will they just get rid of that loophole and then we're stuck in something really dark? So I think it's important. I think this is really preemptive works for something that like, let's pray to God that it doesn't get that bad again. But I was down in Alabama and I learned that they're trying to take back voting rights for black folks. So that just like makes me think like, wow, they're hiding agendas. So I just appreciate the work you're doing to combat the conservative agenda. I appreciate you. I appreciate you being on. We've, we've never, just so y'all know, I've never met Jaina before. I never even knew she was um, that, that you were coming Jaina. I didn't, I don't even know how you got connected to us, but you are welcome, and and hopefully we can pull you in into Vermont. Um, and just that's my girl. Long time no see though. Love you, mama. <laughs> just so you know, I mean, and folks have folks have asked me. They're like, you know, um, have you um, you know, have you considered you know getting out of here? You know, and, and what do you, you know, it's, you know, we I hear what you're saying, and and you know, it, do you have plans? You know do you have plans to, to leave? And, you know, as, as if s somehow or another, I'm going to let somebody run me out of a state or something. I don't, I don't really, I think part, some of the premise is, is that, well, if you're doing the work, then that must mean you don't like it here. So you want to leave. Let me tell you something. I've, I've lived in 17 states in four countries and I've lived here longer than any place I've ever lived in my life. And the amount of time that I've been here, is probably equivalent to maybe six or seven of the locations that I've been to combined. Um, so I've been here 13 years. So, um, the, and which means, which, what I'm really getting at is just that I'm old. But the point is, is that, uh, you know, the work that we're doing, it's just to make, in, in my heart, is to make something good better. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there are good things about Vermont. Um, but to, to 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 think otherwise would somehow or another suggest that we are powerless or we are stupid. Uh, those of us who are here, and none of those are true. Uh, so um, I can get an amen on that, and we'll move on. Um, I think um, 
you know, where I want to where I want to move to is, is if you, do you have contact information, Jaina, uh, to the organization and those of us who are here and stuff like that? You know how to reach us, right? Yes. Um, I if I email you just like generic contact info, will someone to, uh, message me? I don't know if I have anyone's email. So yeah, um, there's um, Maya's going to hook you up. She's going to drop it in the chat. We don't we don't want to lose you. So don't so don't be no stranger. So let let's move hey, on. Boss, I said hey, and I'm still waiting for my meeting. She knows what I'm talking about. By the way, I was going to say, Reverend Hughes. Yes. Um, Boryang, who is the director for the Vermont Human Rights Commission, has some yeah. nerve <laughs> because one, she's a woman of color and um, she should be really pushing this um, act. What was the act? The one that they are on with the attorney general. Um, and I don't know if Susan Young, I'd yet to meet her. Um, but if it was the old attorney general, Thomas, um, I might forget his name. <laughs> She's my professor. Oh my God, what a day. He knows, he knows. TJ. TJ. Yes, Donovan, Donovan. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I just, you know, I definitely think that they are aware. And that's the thing with Vermont. It's a lot of awareness, so not a lot of actions. And the difference between us and them, we are about that life and we're about that action life. So let me let me give you some. Through. I'm I'm gonna give I feel you, I feel you, Corinne, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna rush you through a couple of things real quick because. What I'm doing is I'm giving you the facts. I'm giving you, I'm giving you the facts on how we got here. Um, I've heard, now understand, I conceived this constitutional amendment sitting at my, my, dining, my dining room table in Cabot, Vermont in 2015. And I introduced it to our team and we were growing the JFA at the time. And by the time we got to the point of introducing um, Act 54, which was, um, I forget what the bill was, but at any rate, uh, we had developed a consensus that this is something that we wanted to come back after, but a lot of things happened. And I've talked to hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of people across the state. I have uh, folks within our organization, folks within our partner organizations. We have the Abolish Slavery National Network who are, uh, Max Parthis, thank you for joining us today. Partners at a national level. We have Faith in Action, partners at a national level. Vermont Interfaith Action, partners at a statewide level. And there's a lot of folks that are having a lot of conversation. Focus groups have been conducted. Uh, so where we're at right now is, is we're having, um, we're, we're, we're getting a lot of feedback and I think I saw somebody fall off. I don't know who fell off. Um, who'd we lose? Me. Oh, that was you? Okay. Well, that was an unnecessary distraction. <laughs> so so the, um, the, what I'm getting, getting ready to show you is I'm gonna give you a little bit of a taste of some of the things that have happened. In 2016, um, and you can find this on Orca Media uh, as well as CCTV, we interviewed all candidates for the Senate of Washington County and Chittenden County. That would include folks like Debbie Ingram, who had no clue that it, that it was even in the Constitution at the time. And we laugh about that. Debbie's a really good friend of mine. Um, that would include Tim Ash. Uh, that would include Jenny Loins, Loins. That would include um, folks like um, Ann Cummings. Uh, at the time, Ashley Hill and and others who were you, you look back and see who historically was running for Senate in Washington. So I won't get into that. Nobody knew this language existed in the Constitution. Nobody knew. I was I remember walking down. I used to live in Montpelier, walking down the street with Jim Condos. Jim, did you know? No way. These people took an oath to this Constitution. This is the document where every Every legislative agenda is measured by the litmus test of this constitution. In every argument of any of the constitutionality of any um, statute is measured at the ultimately at the Supreme Court against this document, the constitution. In every uh, elected official, every officer, every military official, everybody takes an oath to this constitution. So that's how consequential the language in the Constitution is. So I didn't come to build this case too heavily, but I just wanted to remind you, whenever you hear anybody tell you that the Constitution is a historical document, 
and that somehow or another, we just, we can just leave language in this constitution because we can just, we can use this constitution as some kind of storage uh, um, uh, apparatus for a, um, uh, some kind of relic or maybe some kind of, uh, to memorialize some concept um, I want you to categorically reject that because the Constitution is what we live by. Uh, it's it's what it's what it, it governs every statute, every rule, every institution, everything that this that this state represents. So the language in the Constitution is very very important. You don't believe me? Go do something unconstitutional and see how quick you'll be in front of a judge. That's why I didn't understand why Peter Teachout, the professor of constitutional law at Vermont Law School, would say, and I quote, in terms of substantive rights, it's absolutely no change. Like, what causes it? Anyways, they'll deal with me when I start so class. I appreciate you, Corinne. You're going to see him. Uh, but you know what? I want just for the record, Peter. Uh, Peter actually and I, he and I get along, and and he, and we and we well, we don't agree to disagree, but we we, we do agree that we don't agree. Um, oh, and, I wish I had many people like that. <laughs> that's fine. So um, there is a um, there's a track record. We went through the. I personally went to the Constitution, the Const the um, the Platform Con Convention, and presented this because at the time I was the um, Affirmative Actions Chair of the Vermont Democratic Party at that time. And the platform of the Vermont Democratic Party was changed and did reflect their desire to amend the Constitution <laughs> uh, to abolish slavery. And that held in, in 2018, and it was only in 2020 that they withdrew it. So if I was a reporter, I would ask the Vermont Democratic Party why they withdrew that in the middle of the constitutional process because it hadn't finished yet. But I'm not a reporter. But the point I'm making is, is there's there's so many other things that we did. There's the Racial Justice Reform Coalition. We went to Senate leadership uh, to urge them, as I told you before, uh, to amend the Constitution the next year. Tim Ash refused to do so. I already told you what happened in the House, H.R. 25, that did happen, okay? And then, of course, uh, I just told you that the party reaffirmed its position on its platform in 2018. And there's more. Because what we did is, is that we put forward language for a proposal for the constitutional amendment in, two, in, 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 uh, in 18. But did you know that the League of Cities and Towns, 251 towns represented, unanimously passed a resolution expressing their desire that the Constitution be amended to reflect that slavery and voluntary servitude are pro prohibited in all forms. The League of Cities and Towns, it's on record. Where are they now? If I was a reporter, I would go to the League of Cities and Towns and ask them what their position is on this and why they've fallen si silent on it, on it in, the last, in, the, in the 11th hour. But of course, I'm not a reporter. Uh, so here's another thing. Um, the um, Let's keep going on this. I'm, this is getting good. I have some of this. I'm excited because I had forgotten. Okay, so the Senate by Senator Ingram. So, oh yeah, so the Senate passes it, PR2, amended constitution, removing slavery. We there's testimony that, that went forward on it. Oh, looky here, the Vermont Episcopal Diocese, their consul unanimously approved the release of a letter uh, to the Senate Government Operations Committee supporting PR2. This is the same uh, Vermont Episcopal Diocese whose um, bishop is a black woman. What is her position on this today? I wonder what that is. Hmm, I don't know. Um, I would probably go find out if I was an interested person, an outside person. We're too busy doing other things, uh, but these are facts. Um, Oh, did you know that the Vermont Governor's Workforce on Equity and Diversity Council unanimously voted? This is the Governor's Council. Unanim unanimously voted uh, up on this thing. And then, of course, you know, all of the other uh, Senate, uh, the legislative thing. Why am I telling you this? The reason why I'm going over this is because what I'm establishing is, is that the work has been done. 
the people have been reached, the conversations have been had, and there are various entities across this state to include the NAACP and the ACLU who have stood behind us on this, leading through this process. Many of them are not around now. Um, there are maybe reasons why that is. We're, we're not concerning ourselves with that, but the, the point is that these are the facts. What are your questions concerning this so far? And then we're gonna go in and we're gonna take a look at this constitution and find out what the heck is in here. We have memories like elephants, so we'll remember them like they remembered us, right? Um, also, on the 28th, <laughs> the governor will be in Burlington, so pull up, pull up, just say it. Maxwell, I mean Maxwell, Maximus, do you have anything? Oh, I got the wisdom from the Paul Cuffey Center. I always got plenty to say, um, but wise, uh, wise, wise. Let me just say it like this. This is not just Vermont doing this. This is a national movement. This year alone, there's five on the ballot who are doing the same. We've already done it in three other states in the past couple of years. As of 2023, there are nearly two dozen states who are also going to be doing the same thing. Six of them already have their legislation set and ready to go for 2023. It's a national effort because it requires a national response. We have to get to the point where slavery has been abolished from every state that has these caveats, which has fed or led to convict leasing, mass incarceration, warehousing of bodies, over-policing, uh, criminalization of Black life and minority life. All of these things stem from this incentivization of incarceration through the 13th amendment we got some so, work to do let's let's keep it moving i'm gonna come back to you okay let's let, we got some work to do because we we haven't even all of this conversation uh we've been on this call now uh since uh over an hour and now we finally got to the constitution we finally got to the constitution what in the heck are we doing why did we go through all of that stuff why do we go talk to all of those people? Why is it that we went in 2019, um, I, I ran then Senator Ingram down and said, remember, you said you was gonna do something about this? Okay, so we introduced that thing. We went into the Senate government operations where Jeanette White was chairing and we fought it out with Peter Teachout and Dick McCormick. And, and others who are, and Dick McCormick, by the way, is the only one who voted against this in the Senate. We fought it out tooth and nail uh, with the legislative council, uh, with Peter Teachout, um, and they they brought in so many uh, concocted ideas and thoughts, and 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 they were outweighing us because they they out politicized us because the legislature listens to them more than they listen to us. Besides, who is a nappy-headed boy from Waterloo, Iowa, the fifth of five boys of a single uh, mother who, who's never even finished a, an advanced degree? What, what could I possibly have to say up against a, uh, an attorney who's been at the Vermont Law School for nearly 50 years? So there's, there are, there's, there's a whole lot of factors and a lot of forces that we were fighting against, in fact, they were ready, and you can go look back, those of you who are reporters, you can go and look back at what it is they tried to introduce because it's all on record that we, at the 11th hour, they were getting ready to introduce it to the full Senate. And the problem with that would have been is, is once there are rules, once you release it from the Senate the first time, there is no way to amend that constitutional amendment. It's not like a bill. Once it comes out of that government operations, it is, it is what it is. I'm gonna pause for a minute and ask you to think briefly and subliminally uh, about PR5 and why you know so much about it, but you know nothing about this, okay? Take that with you, we're gonna keep moving. So this is what it is. This, is. this is the Constitution and this is the beginning of the Constitution. You don't have to go to Article 11 like you do to understand PR5 to find this. I can understand if you don't understand PR5 because it would take you so long to find it if you're reading the Constitution. This is the beginning of the Constitution. 
the first article. So if you set your stopwatch and you let me start reading, you tell me how long it takes you to find this to be problematic, starting now. That all persons are born equally free and independent and have certain natural, inherent, and unalienable rights, amongst which are the enjoying and defending life and liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. Therefore, no, poor, no person born in this country or brought from overseas ought to be holden by law to serve any person as a servant, slave, or apprentice after arriving to the age of 21 years, unless bound by the person's own consent after arriving to such age or bound by law for the payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like. Hard stop. As Maxwell would say, what is the like? <laughs> That's just the beginning of the conversation. So what we've done is we've, we've highlighted the problematic language. Because what we know is it's after arriving at the age of 21 years old. So these are the exception clauses. These are the conditions where in which the Vermont Constitution permits slavery, or I should say they forbid slavery, but with these exceptions. The exception is if you are under the age of 21, that is unambiguous, very easy to read, uh, unless you're bound by your own consent. And also, if you're bound by law for the payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like. These are exception clauses. As in Vermont likes to enslave children. <laughs> Those now, are the little I'm not going to get into the implications today because this is 101. And, and, and by the way, by no, back to facts. We're speaking in facts. But like I said, you know, I, you know, th there are plenty of lawyers. You, you can't swing a cat without hitting a lawyer around here. So there are plenty of lawyers. There are plenty of legislators. There are plenty of folks. We got law school folks and all that other stuff. That's really, if we get stuck on exactly what one of the things, remember what we agreed upon at the top of this conversation? Slavery is reprehensible. Slavery is an abomination. Slavery is a crime against humanity. That is all. So if we still agree upon that, then what we should agree upon is, is something needs to be done about this language because what we're looking at here and what we've been experiencing here in the state of Vermont for the last 245 years is language in our constitution that under certain circumstances, allows slavery. Is there any disagreement? Is there, is there anybody on the call who sees this language and says, well, maybe it could mean something else? Perhaps the legislature got it all wrong twice. Maybe all these organizations that supported it, maybe they just, maybe they weren't looking at it straight. So what to do about it? The good news about what to do about it is, is that the vast majority of it's done. This is the one-on-one. -on -one. What we got to do about it is, is just like we were saying a couple of days ago, show up and register. Register to vote. And we're going to, we, we continue to distribute masks, test kits. Uh, we're here now. There's going to be... The, you, our, our scheduled hours uh, of operation will be posted soon, but this will always be a place where you can come to register to vote. This will always be a place, even after this election, be, and, until I have nothing else to do with the Racial Justice Alliance, we're always within the Kemp Center, there's gonna be a voter registration application for you here. Okay, so, because you can't vote for PR2 if you're not voting. And, but what we know, and now I'm gonna get on voting just for a minute because so many people died for this. And so many people suffer as a result of it. And the voter suppression is at an all-time high. And there are fewer people who can vote today than there was at the peak of the Civil War period in, in 1860. The, our, our rights have been decimated. Uh, the, Civil, the Voter Rights Act of 1965 has been gutted. Uh, it has not been revisited. Uh, voter suppression uh, is on the uprise uh, and has never been as critical. It's never been as serious as it is right now. And 
what we know about voting is this, just in case somebody missed the memo. If you take one group of people and that same group of people are the folks that you are electing and they're the same group of folks that are voting for the folks that you're electing and you do that for five years and 10 years, 100 years, 240 years, then when you walk through their state house, mostly everybody whose picture is in that state house will look the same. And what happens with that is, is the vast majority of the time, and this is human psychology, forget about racism, this is human psychology. When you are elected, when you are placed in an executive position as an official, and you are entrusted with appointee authority, the vast majority of people that you will appoint will look like you. That's psychology. That's, that's why Phil staff looks like him. But don't blame Phil because he didn't start it. So what we're talking about is voting and the importance of voting. Um, so we don't want to we don't we don't want to second guess that one. So that's one thing that we can do that you can do is register to vote. Well, I'm already registered. Did you move? Did you get married? Did any did your status change in any way? It's not good enough to register. We need to stay on top of our registration, our voter registration status. I got a license. It's like your driver's license. You ever look at it? You might find it, it's expired if you're not careful. So your voter registration status is more important than your driver's license. So, so let's get after that. Um, the second thing is, is you can go to VT, uh, uh, you can go to abolishslaveryvt.org. And we're still, we're, we're struggling because we're doing a lot of things at the same time. We're, so I'm not going to apologize for the site, but we're doing the best we can. We'll continue. We'll get on it. We'll continue to do that. So, um, so there's that as well. Uh, and, and take a look at some of the things that you can do. The most important thing you can do out there is take the pledge. Take the pledge because that's going to also put you on a list and we're going to reach out to you and going to say, hey, you want to get involved in a phone bank? Uh, do you want to get involved on some door knocking? We've got some signs. Go grab one of them signs, man. We got some, we got some yard signs that people are scared to put in their yards. Uh, because a lot of our partners across the state, um, there's, there's so much white fragility that folks are afraid to have a conversation and even hold one of these signs up. Th these signs are probably could be more toxic than the Black Lives Matter signs. And we've got, we probably got more, th more of them than Black Lives Matter has their signs. Hold it up. So, that, so, so put a sign in your yard. Don't worry, when Black Lives Matter first started, those were in the trash and I had to go collect them. Okay, uh, so yeah. they'll come around. Stop by the camp center and grab a t-shirt, grab a t-shirt. Stop by the camp center and grab a t-shirt. Do I have one? Get a sticker. Oh, this ain't one. Get some stickers. Um, uh, and and when, you, when you pledge, there's gonna be some door knocking and there's some, there's some other stuff. Put some money in the game. We're registered with the Secretary of State. Get some money in the game. Those are some of the things you can do. Why? Because this is what we want to do with that language. What, what I'm saying is, uh, and you can see, you can see there, hold on for a minute. Let me just stop this for a minute. Look at there. Look at that. Look at that shirt. Look, you got it. Jaina, you you send me a note. We'll send you a, we'll send you some of them just so you can have one you. for your. We got you. Yeah, we got you. We got you. So so I'm so now what again, this is one-on-one, -on -one, right? We're just now I can. We can get into the bushes. We can get into the weeds on this thing and get you all distracted and have you scratching your head saying, what in the, what is going on? Should I really, what is, why? Well, you know, and, and people get, people are getting confused because again, there's a, this cognitive dissonance and folks are like, a, a lot of folks can't get past the fact that we are not the first state to abolish slavery. Because if we were, we wouldn't be looking at what we're looking at right now. You can say it however you want to say it. You can slice it however you want to slice it. And I don't mean it in a harmful way. And I've been accused of being mean just for telling the truth before. But I just have to tell the truth. Um, the Bible tells us that we are to do justice and to love mercy and walk humbly in all that we do. The Bible tells us that when we deal with people who are poor, that we are not to oppress them because that's an abomination to the Lord God himself. So now let me talk to you like a preacher right now. And what I'm telling you is we have, we don't just have a responsibility, we have a duty to address this because what this has created 
is it has created poverty and it has selected a certain group of people to be the benefactors of that policy of that poverty and it's manifesting itself in housing education employment health services acts across all of those social determinants that is why we struggle with this so-called this lightly this word folks throw around lightly um oh it is equity we need to do equity no we need to do justice mm -hmm. We need to love mercy and we need to walk humbly. And this is part of our job. And whether you are a person of faith or whether you are agnostic or whether you're atheistic, where your morals lie, where your, where your worldview lies, you know in your heart that this is the thing that we should be doing as a people because it's slavery and slavery is reprehensible. It is immoral. It is a crime against humanity. Amen. Amen. So would you rather have this? You can't see my screen. Can you see my screen? Somebody talk to me. Yes, yes you can. Okay, that's that's your little iPhone thing. <laughs> Her iPhone is just being persnickety. So would you rather have this? Oh, would you rather have that? All of the work is done. All we got to do now is register, show up at the ballot box, show up at the ballot box. And, and again, think, think about how consequential this vote is. Think about this. One third of the legislature is turning over. What does that mean? They, they quit. Remember the great resignation? It's happening in the legislature too. One third of the legislature yeah, yeah, says, no, thank you. I'm not coming back. Mm -hmm. I don't know that anybody knows of any time that that has ever happened before in this state. Okay. Here's another thing. We've got five statewide officials that are also kind of jumbling around there too. And some pretty consequential elections along, amongst those five statewide officials to include the governor. The lieutenant governor's an interesting race with Joe Benning and David Zuckerman. Oh, Zuckerman. And, and the list goes on and on. There's so many things going on. And I haven't even started with the congressional delegation where Becca Ballant, the first gay woman, is, is vying for the seat of the of, of Peter Welsh, who, who's, who's vying for uh, and a seat left uh, by Patrick Leahy. This is a huge election. And in addition to all of that, in addition to all of that, we've got not one, but two constitutional amendments in a state where it's more difficult to amend the constitution than probably any state in the union. And this one right here goes to the heart of, it goes to the heart of this whole idea of our civil rights and our civil liberties, our human rights here in this state. It, it goes to the heart of it because it talks about people owning people and people profiting from the work of other people. Unjust. Wherever there are people, they're property. <laughs> so. and it, and it, amen. And, and, it, and it goes to the heart of everything to do with everything that we've, we're fighting for today, and that is the legacy of this institution. This is an, for, forget about these words here and just think about it as it is an institution. This constitution was written in 1777. If there was any document written in 1777 that had any provision for slavery, don't tell me that they didn't know what slavery was because it was definitely shadow. So there is much, much more to unpack and I'll give that to you in maybe 102 or 201 or something like that. Maybe after the election, uh, when we get to talking about um, the other implications, the other things that we know, and I'll just give you a preview and we're going to a short discussion. We've already come to understand that this constitution was amended in 1924 uh, and they went straight to this 
article in 1924 and where it used to say women under the age of 18 and men under the age of 21 changed it so it would be women and men under the age of 21 in 1924. Don't tell me you didn't know this language was here. So that's, that's advanced. It, it's, 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 it's relevant, it's important, but we're not gonna wave that flag right now. We'll we can talk about that later. Um, folks are gonna talk about the fact that um, DCF, for example, in Child Perfect Protection Services is black children are 60% more likely to be removed from their homes and 40% more likely to be adopted. Oh, that's what the, the Jamaicans would say. Wickedness, wickedness. That's so, what the Jamaicans would say. This constitution uh -huh. says it's talking about slavery with, with folk under 21. We can talk about that later. We can talk about that later. But what I'm saying, is, and, 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 and I'm going to leave you with this, and this is something for you to think about, and I'll open, open it up for a brief conversation. This is something for you to think about, and this is for those who came to hear about prison slavery or prison labor. Watch this. This is free. I'm going to give this to you free. Read that. This is the premise upon which most of the states across the United States, if not all, are doing some of the work. Now, I, I already showed you the trajectory that we came from, okay? And we were fully aware of this. Uh, and the, words are important. They matter. Words matter. They, they matter a lot. And the first pushback I got is, is don't worry about it. It's just words in our constitution. The 13th amendment has us covered. And I asked myself, what does that mean? What does that mean? Um, so the more I looked at this and the more I think about it and the more that I've grown to understand what this language here means. And the more I see people talking about prison labor across the United States, the more I've come to understand now watch this, I'm no lawyer, I'm no lawyer, but watch this. Because what we know, and this is gonna get ugly in a minute, but it's, I'll, I'll straighten it out. What we know is, is that cannabis is a schedule one drug, but yet and still on October 1st, it will be taxable and regulatable here in the state because it's decriminalized and legalized. What we know is, is that as far as immigration is concerned, there are certain standards, protocols, and rules that law enforcement has regarding uh, interaction with and apprehension and detention of them. But we know that the fair and impartial policing policy in Title 20, 23, 23, 2366, provides provisions whereby our law enforcement, all 79 agencies, cannot and wink in certain instances. And that's not a bad thing, particularly in light of the fact that once again, we're talking about an industry. A minute ago, we were talking about a cannabis industry, which is profitable for the state, right? Mm -hmm. This is the dairy industry, because what we know is, is that 1,500 people who are undocumented immigrants are here in this state, and they run and control, God bless you, God bless you, migrant justice, <laughs> that industry, and Hannaford's get on the train. So we know that. We know these things. We also know that when Donald Trump came into office, that there was a fear that there was a possibility that Roe versus Wade would be overturned. So they, they placed in statute language that provided the reproductive right protection of women in the state of Vermont as early as 2019 and started a constitutional amendment, PR5. So the law of the land now may be Roe versus Wade, but we have different values here in this state. In fact, we have different values regarding each of them. Watch me, stay with me. I'm getting ready to take, make a turn. Now watch this. This is the 13th Amendment. This is the law of the nation. But what predated that is this. And this 
has three exceptions to slavery. Only three. Only three. The three exceptions are arriving at the age of 21, bound by a person's own consent, or the payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, and the like. That is all. So this is not an exception in this state. And these cannot be, they, they have to be mutually exclusive because our constitution is clear and it always has been clear. And I posit that our constitution has never embraced the 13th amendment and that exception clause for the last, for the last several, you know, 10 or uh, seven or eight decades. Now, again, I'm not a constitutional scholar, but I don't see anything in our constitution that suggests that this is an exception. I'll, I'll pause there. That's 101. So when people talk, you know, about this whole thing about prison slavery and all that other stuff, you know, obviously there's a whole lot more conversation to have, and we can have that conversation later. But I'll close with this, and I'll be curious to hear your thoughts about what you've seen and heard tonight, is, is that slavery is an abomination. It is a crime against humanity. It's a sin. It, it flies in the face of every moral fiber in every single one of our bodies. That is a fact. Fact number two is, is our constitution permits it in three particular instances. Fact number three is, is we've done the work. We've, got, we've done everything that needed to, be, get, to get done in order to move us to a point to fix that. And the final fact, which I think is the most true, is, is that you are, an, you are an abolitionist and you are in a position today to do something about it. Cast that vote. Amen. What's your thoughts? Karina, I know you got something to say. Come on. I know I'm you're a slavery abolitionist, so I get real specific with them. Um, yeah, vote. And if you want to learn more, I always plug Abolition Today, which is the best education to learn about what it means to be an abolitionist, what it's the slavery thing even is, and how it came to about in America and in Vermont. Um, so obviously I'm for Prop 2. I do got to go because she's a busy gal. Um, Jane and Mummy, so good to see you. And um Yes, everybody have a blessed night. Obviously, we're going to vote. Obviously, we're going to be those people, that girl, that boy who votes for Prop 2. And that's just the vibe. Obviously, we're slavery abolitionists. So power to the people. May the people get the power. I got to go. Hey, Corinne, good to see you tonight. Thanks for showing up. Adrian, talk to me, man. Did you learn anything? Did I, did I bore you? Did I put you to sleep, Adrian? No, you didn't. This has actually been really helpful and great background information for me. Like I said, this is something that I've been interested in ever since I was like a student at UVM. So to have this background info is really helpful, especially as we start to go into our commitment 2022 coverage and going getting closer to November. And, you know, I would definitely love to connect with you guys after this and maybe be able to have a sit down and maybe get into more uh, details and to be able to really get this on TV and, you know, get the word out there for folks to know that this is something that they should be on the lookout for when they hit their ballot box in November. No doubt. Hey, I appreciate you hanging in there all the way to the end, too, because, you know, we, we've been flat out for an hour and I, I know you're busy just like everybody else. For thanks, So thanks for uh, making a commitment, brother. Thank you. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Jaina, what do you got for me? What, did you learn anything or, or did I just make you mad? No, that was great. I knew this was important, but I didn't realize how shady the loopholes were for Vermont specifically. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, and I'm very interested to get into more conversations. I learned so much about how the legislator and government works. Just like yeah. really appreciate all your insights. No doubt. Uh, where are you located at geographically? I'm in Colchester, Vermont. You're in Colchester? I'm in Burlington. Yeah. Okay. Right on. I, I, I don't even recognize your name, face, nothing. You could have been in DC. I don't, I don't. So you, then you know us, you know our people. Isaac is on. That's our uh, community engagement and support uh, director, Isaac Holler, it's your boy. What's going on? <laughs> part of my, my tardiness. Oh, let me put it in my camera real quick. That's all good. 
Yeah. Main things, get out and vote, but, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You know, this is this is a monumental moment. You want to be a part of this, mm-hmm. no doubt. Get together. Appreciate you, Isaac. Thank you for showing up. And um, yeah, thank you all for coming. I see. I see Jaina. She don't know. I've seen her. She's the only person that's tagged on TikTok for anything Vermont uh, racial racial anything racially um, that has to do with Vermont. So I've, I've been seeing your page on TikTok, Jaina. I don't even have a TikTok, so. <laughs> YouTube, one of them. YouTube, Facebook. You got, you do videos surrounding Vermont. Um, just My astrology to... videos? Something. Those are different, I've seen yeah. you doing some videos. Cool, okay. <laughs> you working. That's a- Let's um also Jaina, when you reach out to our folks, whoever responds, um, we're gonna be like I said, we're gonna be doing a blitz of a number of events, uh, some of which most of which the staff don't even know about yet because we we're get we gotta we gotta do a pivot. We we we're doing a what what we call an audible in the football game. We call it an audible, right? <laughs> Sit ready, right? So we so we're doing the audible, and uh, so just and I'm so proud to be surrounded by um, Maya and, and Vincent. Um, before we hear from them, I just want to just, uh, you know, thank the team, uh, Maya, uh, who's the, um, the, the uh, training, the outreach and education uh, directors uh, in de- definitely has been uh, really instrumental in a lot of things that we're doing. You've met Isaac. And then of course, um, we've got the program director here, Vincent, uh, Vincent Mitchell is sitting right next to me. He's he's our guy. He's also our bouncer, uh, just in case um, <laughs> just in case anybody get all crazy and stuff like that. So don't so don't. Um, so, but anyway, yeah, I wanted to get some feedback from the two of y'all before we got out of here. Uh, what's your thoughts, brother? Man, like I said, every every time that you know you get a chance to hear the the gospel, the word is mm-hmm. is this is this encouraging? And, yeah, and it, it kind of lights you up. It brings mm-hmm. the fire. If it hadn't brought it to you, it, it, it just ignites it. And you know, once once your eyes are wide open to the truth, you can no longer walk with your eyes wide shut. And yeah. I think that's something that you know that that was that was happening collectively. I mean, I don't know. Everybody has that ta-da, but you know, <laughs> I, think, ta-da. I think for me, it's it's been you know, even when I was thirteen, you know, being victimized of police brutality, you know, coming home from school and, mm. you know, in the inner city of Patterson, New Jersey, and mm. like trying to figure out out of all the kids, why are you walking up to me? Start with me, you know, because mm. I'm tall, black, and, you know, just walking. And, you know, I just reflect, I, I just reflect off of certain things uh, and to the point where I'm at right now. And, and even having to deal with, you know, some of the systematic racism that's going on in, in our school districts mm. currently. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's 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 one of those things to where like, you know, when you get um, an alignment on, on on Noah's Ark, you know, you got to figure out what what part of the boat you want to be on because we're gonna be floating. <laughs> we're gonna be floating. We're gonna be flowing through the city, you know, and, and we we tapping into neighborhoods that you know definitely needs to awaken, you know, in, uh, along with ours. You know what I'm saying? So it's just been like really really exciting to to be a part of of change. I appreciate you. Um, and I will close out right after this. We just ran a few minutes over, but I'm not going to let Maya off the hook because Maya always tries to get off the hook. Without. So you, you want to yeah, give I, some thoughts? Well, um, one thing that I do want to mention is you gave some really good examples of how the system is self-correcting and self-healing, stuff mm-hmm. like that. So um, that was something new that I've, that I've heard um because i've been in these meetings a lot of these meetings and that was something new that i that i heard from you and it was you gave some really good examples on that um thanks so yeah it's it's really important to um get out and vote and just um let your voice be heard so that we can make change thanks Maya. Yeah. and thanks again uh it's um it's it's awesome to be on these meetings and, and have this, the staff here. And, and what we'll do is, is we're going to be in All Souls Church on Saturday. I don't have the times yet, but All Souls has invited us. Um, First Congregational Church has invited us out for Tuesday. That's 38 South Winooski. That's at three uh, at 6 p.m. here in Burlington, 38 South Winooski. Uh, we'll be giving a community presentation. All of this stuff will be going out like lickety split. 
on uh, Wednesday. Um, it's uh, First Baptist. I think that's on um, that's Karen Mendez's church. It's over on um, um, right off of you know where how Bank goes down in that. Um, mm -hmm. What is that? Um, first, uh, Saint something? No. Saint Paul. Saint Paul. Saint Paul Street. So the, so that's there. Uh, that's going to be Wednesday night. Uh, on at 6 p.m. and on Thursday night at 6 p.m. we'll be in the library uh, in Fletcher Free Library, uh, and then um, we we will we will look and see what else is left because what we want to do is we just want to do a little bit of a blitz leading up to the first because the first of October uh, ballots are going out so we've got some 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 um, wiggle room there where we can get a couple of other events in. We will start to broadcast, so I'm going to reach out to our folks over at Channel 17 and others, and also we'll start broadcasting ourselves uh, on um, on Facebook. I was going to do that this evening, but I ran into a little bit of technical difficulty, but I, th I'm, I don't think it's insurmountable. We'll, we'll come back uh, to that. Um, so just to let you know, that pivot, that that audible that we're calling is, is we want to do this on our terms. Uh, we do have national partners who we love and, and respect. Uh, we also have state partners who we love and respect and understand. Um, we've, you know, the, um, the, as the information begins to come in and as we uh, experience uh, the, um, you know, some of the, um, you know, some of the, um, um, I guess, I, for lack of better terms, I'll, I'll just call it a, a um, like a data loop in terms of how, you know, how we're getting information back in through, you um, some of the work that we're doing in the communities and the conversations that we're having, having, it's becoming increasingly clear that we need to get our voice uh, out front. We need to tell our story about what it is that we've done concerning this work. And we need to make it very clear uh, what this is all about, because I think, um, you know, it is, it's insidious, it's unfortunate, it's sad, but the very challenge that we have sought to address is is the uh, it is the it is the obstacle that prevents us from progress from from making the progress that we want to and that is systemic racism um you know and that that's really not trivial if you think about the the media and how the media has handled this incredibly important issue and constitutional amendment and if you think about um, just uh, the response from community, the response from our alleged partners on this, and even you know the um, the string that we've been hanging by in terms of financially and how to get this work done. There is no interest in this work. There is absolutely no interest in the work of uh, uh, this constitutional amendment. There's there's an entrenchment. Uh, in Vermont that would uh, seek to try to keep this conversation as um, quiet as possible. And I think there is a desire largely for voters just to kind of go to the voting ballot and just kind of um, hold their nose and just fill in the blank, fill in the block, the oval, and just get past this so this can, we can all be on the other side of this, all without having a conversation on, on the connection uh, of the legacy of slavery uh, to the institution of slavery and the validity of the conversation that slavery has always existed in the Constitution of Vermont. Good night, y'all. Uh, thank you for coming uh, and bless you all.